Good morning, colleagues. On behalf of the Director General, Ministry of the Public Service, I welcome you to today's webinar entitled Cybersecurity and You. My name is Michael Clark, Human Resource Officer with the Learning and Development Directorate, Ministry of the Public Service. And today I will be your moderator, moderator as we explore the topic of cybersecurity and how it relates to you. We would really like to hear from you and would like to include your voice in the conversation. But before we get there, here are some rules of engagement that we want to share with you. Mute your microphone. Disable your video. Pause, minimize distractions as much as possible. Focus fully on the presentation. Share what you have learned in the chat. Reflect on your own experiences and participate in the activities. This session promises to be very informative and there is time allocated for a question and answer segment. You will be given the opportunity to use the chat box and share your comments. Our team will be monitoring the chat space to share your questions and comments with the facilitator. At this point, I want to introduce our presenter for this webinar, Captain Gil Morgan. Captain Morgan is a 30 year veteran of the Barbados Defense Force and an experienced IT administrator with over 19 years of experience. During her tenure in the BDF, she received training in darknet investigations for law enforcement and lawful interception, electronic surveillance and cyber intelligence. She has also completed an executive certificate program in cybersecurity leadership and strategy at Florida International University. The program in cybersecurity studies at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Germany and the level one program in creating and coordinating computer security incident response teams at the National Cybersecurity Institute in Lyon, Spain. Captain Morgan holds a postgraduate certificate in training the IT trainer, a Bachelor of Arts degree in history, and she will be completing a Master's of Science degree in cybersecurity with a specialization in incident response and business continuity in September 2020. Captain Morgan is a member of the nonprofit membership US based organization, Women in Cybersecurity. She is also the recipient of the Chief of Staff's commendation, the Defense Board's commendation, the Services Medal of Honor, the General Service Medal, and the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. Captain Morgan is currently attached to the Ministry of Innovation, Science, and Smart Technology. And I will now invite you, Captain Morgan, to begin your presentation. Over to you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. And I want to take this opportunity as well to extend a very warm welcome to all of our virtual participants. Um, this morning's presentation is entitled Cybersecurity and You. And before we actually begin, I want to make a very short disclaimer. Um, because cybersecurity is a very broad um, topic, you'll find due to the time constraints that we have this morning, that I would only be a bit, um, able to cover only the basic topics and I probably would not be able to go into much depth. So with that being said, um, we're, I want to point out that by the end of this presentation, you should be able to gain a better understanding of what cybersecurity is and its importance to the operation of the public sector. Um, additionally, you, you will be able to identify the various categories of cyber, cyber crimes, and you would also have a better knowledge of the strategies that are being used to mitigate the risk of these cyber threats. The phenomenal um, advances that have been made um, within information technology, especially the advancements that have been made to improve internet access over the past decade has completely changed our way of life. And in many instances, it has changed life so that it is a bit easier. However, it also comes with a drawback. Because of our increased exposures to the internet, we are also being exposed to a higher risk of cyber threats. Let's have a look at the internet. First of all, um, we're gonna use the analogy of an iceberg um, to describe how the internet is made up. 
First of all, an iceberg has a tip that is visible. However, below the waterline, there is a lot of mass and that the majority of its size is underneath that line. And that's the same analogy we're gonna to use to describe the internet. On the surface, we have the surface web. Um, this is the portion that majority of us are very comfortable uh, with. This is the portion that is visible um, and it makes up approximately only 4% of the actual size of the web. All right, this portion that is, is visible is readily accessible. That means as soon as you click, you're there. This is the portion that you use your web browsers and search engines to um, find items, articles, videos, and so on and so forth. Underneath that, however, there's something called the deep web. Now the deep web is referred to as the invisible web. It's the hidden part of the internet. However, because the contents are not indexed, the web crawlers and the web engines, search engines such as Google, Yahoo, and the others cannot find these articles that are stored here. However, at last count, and this is a statistics that was um, um, published last year, it is, it is proclaimed that nearly 500 trillion terabytes of information is stored in the deep web. Because it can't be seen doesn't mean that you can't get access to it. It's, all, it's also accessible. However, the only way you can access it is if you know the exact IP address of, and, and the URL or, of the location of where these information is stored. As you can see, it has a whole host of information, um, academic, medical, so on and so forth. And then we go to the last portion, which is called the dark web. Now the dark web is that deep part of the web that is only accessible if you use a specific type of application. Um, and there's a browser called Tor. Now, when it was first um, developed, it was with very good intentions. And that is to provide a platform for people who were in countries that suppress their uh, human rights to freely, freely express. Um, and therefore, this part of the web was created so that they could have a platform that was free of surveillance, that was free of monitoring, and it provided them a very safe cloak for them to be anonymous. Although it had very good intentions, it soon turned out to be a haven for criminals and their um, illicit activity. Nine times out of 10, if there is a data breach, um, there is a chance that all the stolen information is sold in this area. Let's look at the cybercrime and what cybercrime is. Uh, there are many definitions for the word cybercrime. Um, one that comes to mind is uh, uh, a term or is an umbrella term that it, it, to cover all act, criminal activity that either targets or uses a computer or computer network or network device to further illegal activity. Um, activity such as fraud, stealing identities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's still on the rise. According to statistics that was recently uh, released by the FBI in the United States, um, they said since the um, beginning of the corona pandemic, that cybercrime has actually jumped to as much as 300%. Most states um, have enacted legislation to combat cybercrime. In the case of Barbados, uh, we have the Computer Misuse Act, and there are a number of other um, similar acts that have been passed throughout the region. And this act outlines, outlines sorry, a number of activities that are considered prohibited and may attract fines of up to $200,000 or imprisonment for up to seven years or both. Cybercrime is also defined into three major categories. 
Now, these categories are cybercrime against government, cybercrime against property, and cybercrime against persons. Now, cybercrimes against government is considered an attack on the nation's sovereignty. And because of that, there are specific activities that are classified as cybercrimes against government. And these are cyber ter uh, terrorism, cyber espionage, and cyber uh, information warfare. Additionally, there are cyber crimes against property. Now, cyber crimes against property, as it states, is against all forms of property and not just physical property. So, these type of acts could include um, theft of intellectual property. It could be or it could be computer vandalism. And when we say cyber vandalism or computer vandalism. What we mean is the destruction or damaging of data or information that is stored on a computer, and it may also include the physical harm done to a computer or server. Now, this kind of harm is actually or usually conducted via hacking, viruses, um, DDoS attacks. And there is also um, service disruption that comes under that same uh, umbrella or category of crime against property. And the last category that we're going to discuss is the crimes against people or crimes against persons. Now, these crimes include things like cyber harassment, um, stalking, um, child, um, distribution, distribution of child pornography, uh, credit card fraud, um, human trafficking, um, identity theft, slander, um, so on and so forth. So those types of crimes are considered crimes against persons or crimes against people. However, I want to interject now that, that there's a discussion that's going on now uh, where they're looking to create a, another category or probably include it under the same umbrella of crimes against person, but they're gonna call it crimes against society. And when they say crimes against society, that means that there are crimes that are, or attacks that are being leveled at persons using cyberspace to incite xenophobia or hate crimes and especially targeting um, specific groups within society, such as like Jews and Christians, um, LGBTQ and, and even um, people, of, people of color. Why is cybersecurity important? Well, um, let's discuss this importance. But before I discuss the importance of cybersecurity, I want to first define what is cybersecurity. Now, cybersecurity is the practice of defending things like computers, servers, uh, mobile devices, electronic systems, so on and so forth. Um, However, this is only one type of definition that could be found. The definition that I really like is the short, concise definition that's being offered um, by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And it says that cybersecurity is the ability to protect or defend the use of cyberspace from cyber attacks. Very short statement. It's the ability to protect or defend the use of cyberspace from cyber attacks. And sometimes we have to break down words within a, a, a definition to grasp exactly what it means. I've just introduced new, two new words with, within this, this um, brief description, and I want to hone into those words, cyberspace and cyber attacks. Now, in this context, cyberspace means the internet, and any and all things that are connected to the internet for the, the, the sole purpose of communication and the also embedded within that, the information systems. And when we said that, it means that we're meaning the infrastructure, the devices, the data, and more importantly, the people that are within that uh, virtual space. And a cyber attack is any attempt to expose to alter, to disable, destroy, steal, 
and or gain unauthorized access or to make unauthorized use of an asset via cyberspace. So I know that's a lot to, to hone in and all um, right now, but we're gonna go and examine just a bit more why cybersecurity is important. Now that we're aware of what cybersecurity is, let's examine why it is important. All right, now it's important really, especially in today's, um, in the era of technology, is because of the convergence of a number of significant factors that are currently going on. Uh, the first factor is, it is the era of smart devices and smartphones. And because of that, it means that a whole host of persons are now being exposed and being a part of uh, the transactions that occur within cyberspace. Additionally, additionally, there is an increased mobility and there is also increased digitalization. So that means that apart from having smartphones now, you are now able to do more things before. In the days that have gone by, and probably just around 10 or 15 years ago, it wasn't very, it wasn't that long ago, when persons had phones, that was about the only thing that you could do with it was make a call and receive texts. However, with the advent of smartphones now, you're having the influx of new apps. And so, so now, apart from making telephone calls, receiving messages, you are now also able to uh, watch videos, uh, download apps, play games, and even conduct financial transactions, right? So that is a significant factor. And that also plays a, a, a significant um, portion in how we relate to cybersecurity as being important. Additionally, um, there are other levels of threats that have been embedded and, and within the realm of cybersecurity and it's becoming a bit more complex. And things that have been included, I refer, I'm referring to actually is the increased threat surface that has occurred due to the introduction of the Internet of Things. Now, the Internet of Things um, really is just a network of uh, devices that are on the Internet. And these little devices or objects are able to collect and exchange data without any human interaction. So things like smart TVs and smart speakers and toys and smart um, phones and watches, uh, smart meters, those type of devices now are now adding a different layer of complexity of threat. And so it contributes to our heightened awareness that cybersecurity must play a higher level of importance. Additionally, but um, uh, and I always can I, I always consider that this being one of the most important factors is our natural beauty. Uh, sorry, our natural ability and tendencies as human beings to trust, and because of that human feeling, um, we unwittingly. Facil facilitate unauthorized activities. And because of that, that itself adds another layer of complexity. But, and again, um, we also had the enactments of legislation. So this has becoming, has be become, sorry, um, more and more important in terms of making sure that we fall in line in following what is happening internationally. And the legislations that I'm really referring to are legislations that require businesses to protect the personal data and the privacy of citizens. When we have all these factors converged, it means then these significant factors mean that we have to pay more attention and place cybersecurity at a higher level of our in priority in terms of importance. Cybersecurity in the public service. Now, cybersecurity public service is an ex extremely important 
and especially because as government embarks on its digital transformation projects, um, we are going to find that more and more citizens will be going to do their online transactions and conduct transactions such as payment for bills and taxes and the renewal of licenses and the storage of digital citizen ID information and all of that will be occurring. Because the government digitization transformation program um, will also see a huge volumes of sensitive information being stored and shared across the networks, the public service has to pay a bit more attention to the importance of cybersecurity within the public service. In some instances, right, some of this data will not be stored in on premises and will be as traditionally um, done before. Data now will be stored in the cloud, and that means that you're allowed to go to the internet to gain access to the services and the stored data. Another layer of complexity that must be considered as well in the management of cybersecurity is the conduct of the public sector administration by employees who are working from home. And in some instances, some of our employees will be doing um, government business and, and, and conducting um, activities on their own personal devices once, of course, um, permission has been granted to do so. So additionally, cyber attacks on government critical infrastructure will also contribute to this, the public service paying a bit more attention to um, cybersecurity. Um, and when we say critical infrastructure, um, we're talking about um, services within, within government that are considered critical to the normal day of life. So you'll find critical infrastructure such as um, oil, natural gas, water and transportation, um, health services, um, air and seaport management. Hi. All of these now are also turning towards using oh. digitalized right. I'm gonna management right applications. Back. I gotta get off this. Oh. When we take all these factors together and we put them together, we realize that the public service will now become very attractive as a target to cyber criminals wishing to disrupt critical services and also to, perform, to somehow profit from gaining um, unauthorized access to resources on the government's network. But I want to make it clear that these factors that are currently facing um, our public service they are not unique. Um, other countries have, are also going through the very same thing. And I want to um, draw attention to a report that was released by Verizon. Um, they had a report for the, the 2019 and the 2020 data breach investigations report. And in it, it stated that 66% of all data breach incidents that occurred in 2019 were actually cyber attacks on the public sector. Additional to that, 51% of the data that was compromised during these breaches were classified as either personal data and the other 33% was classified as compromised credentials. I'm hoping that you will agree <laughs> after you've heard all this that cybersecurity has a significant role to play now in the public sector. Um, before we go any further, um, I've been doing a lot of talking and I want to take this opportunity to get some feedback from you. Based off of everything that we've covered so far, I want you to just put on your think tanks. Um, and I want you to use the chat um, to enter your responses. Tell me, if you can, what are the types of inf cyber infractions that you are aware of right now that affect public service employees when they go online at work? And uh, like I said uh, a little earlier, I would appreciate if you could 
make your comments in the chat so that everybody has the opportunity to respond. And the reason why I want to do that is because I need to canvas exactly our awareness of what is actually going around around us and if there is actually any reason to, to be concerned um, with regards to cybersecurity. If you are aware of any cyber infractions that have been um, affecting any public servants recently, when they go online at work, could you enter that into the chat, please? Hey, Captain Morgan, we have one response here. Mm -hmm. um, someone is saying um, possible attempts at phishing. Very good, yes. Um, that was a very, very valid um, comment, yes. Are there any other um, cyber infractions that you're, you're aware of that are occurring right now? Spam, that's perfect, um, yes. Yes, spam. Uh, Michael, I've noticed there is a very interesting question here that's being posed. Um, in terms of receiving spam emails from a, a secure printer? Yeah, that's what I'm seeing as well. Okay. The credit card was hot. Yes. Okay. Uh, some person is saying malware. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Having to do numerous password resets. Um, brute force attacks. Okay. Okay. Um, free software from third party agreements. <laughs> yeah. So you're getting quite a few. Uh, yes. All okay. right. All right. Well, based, based off of the response, I'm, I'm really grateful that, um, that, that everybody's feeling free to um, interact. And from the responses, um, it seems as if my job is going to be a little easier uh, because everyone has entered some very relevant and interesting um, contributions. Thank you. Right. Yes, off of the responses, it means that everybody is aware that whether we, we want to admit it or not, we are vulnerable to attacks. And regardless of where you're at, if you're at work, if you're at school, or whether you're at home. Um, However, the risk of uh, severe damage to the organization's infrastructure and uh, shared resources on the network, um, I guess will make it seem as that threat being a bit more critical. And as, as public servants, we need to understand exactly what our responsibilities, responsibilities are and how we can mitigate these, these risks. But in order to do that, we have to identify what the cyber threats are first. And so there are, there are a number of common cyber threats that I would like everyone to be aware of. Majority of these that you already know, but maybe there are one or two that we're probably going to further or in depth um, um, discussions that will help in clarifying uh, what they are and what they actually do. All right. Let's look at malware. Um, these are, this is one of uh, uh, the most common cyber threats that exists within cyberspace. Malware is an umbrella term um, that is used to more or less describe any malicious software that is specifically written to infect or harm the uh, whole system or its user. So, they're 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 pretty simple in their in their coding, um, but they can pack a very severe punch. They are known to cause damage to hard drives. They delete files. Um, they bring down a whole network. Um, malware is actually um, divided into either virus or worms. Um, we also have ransomware, 
and we also have Trojans. Now, virus and worms are malicious codes, right? They're both malicious codes, and what they're designed to do is to get into any one of your, your, your nodes or your host computers or servers, a replicate, and just infect systems. Um, ransomware is a type of malicious software that is designed to block access to a computer system until you pay up some money. And I am more than well aware of the fact that there are quite a number of, of, of persons who have been affected by um, ransomware. Um, under malware, we also have the cat this category called Trojans. Now Trojans acts like uh, uh, a gift, you know, it's, it's, always, it's, it's always disguised and hidden into something that looks legitimate. And majority of times it is software. So sometimes somebody will offer you free software and then you think that you've just gotten a, a wonder, wonderful gift. And once you double click on it and install the software, then the malicious code that's hiding inside of that, that application gains access to your, your, your systems. And then this, this, depending on how it's designed with either uh, damage or it might steal information or it just have some other um, harmful action. Another common uh, cyber threat are bots. Now, a bot is really a shortened word for the, um, for, the, for the word robot. And because of that, when you hear a robot, you mean it's something that's like artificial, automated, you know, it has a little bit of artificial intelligence. And basically that's what it is. It's a software application that is programmed to do some automated tasks. Now, I want to make um, a declaration that Bots can either be good bots or they can be um, bad bots. A good bot is something that just hides somewhere and they're usually, they're, they're widely used and, and um, um, embedded in things like your uh, browser and that kind of stuff, just hiding in the background. And what they're, what they're designed to do in that instance, if it's a good bot, is just to collect information. And in, in more cases than not, what they're, they're, they're they're taking um, data to record exactly what are your spending habits, what type of articles you like to read, what type of shoes you like to wear, um, whether you're female or male. And from that, they can get um, data that can be used in legitimate ways um, so as to help people um, either cater to the needs of, of, a, of a user who's browsing or maybe um, improve a product um, because a user indicated that this is his favorite product but doesn't like the, the packaging. Well, that's a good bot. Now, a bad bot or one that's specifically uh, designed to carry out malicious activities are those that are used more likely than not to um, conduct things such as a denial of service attack. All right. Now, a denial of service attack or denial of service or distributed denial of service means the same thing. It actually the aim of that sort of attack is to shut down a network. And when it shuts down the network, work, that network, if it's providing a service, um, would not become accessible to anybody who wants to use it, right? These attacks are really accomplished by overwhelming a specific target. So if it's a server, what it will do, it will overwhelm the target with traffic, right? It will just spit out traffic to the ser the server, and because it's depending on the amount that, that is being sent out, it will overwhelm the resources of that server, and because of that, it'll hang up, and um, and because of that, it it flood, um, the flooding of information will cause it to crash. So often, um, they, their targets would be things like a website of a high profile organization or government or um, a government website or even a media website. Um, and the, the intent is not really when people create or, um, denial of service attacks, the intent is not really to cause damage. What they want to do is just to disrupt the service. And when you disrupt the service, it means in most cases, it means that that business will lose money. 
right? Because it's it's not available anymore for the uses of its its its, uh, its users. Let's go on to the next um, common cyber threat: social engineering. Now, social engineering is a broad statement that is used um, of of psychological manipulation. And what the attackers will do is to exploit one of one weaknesses, one of the weaknesses that um, that 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 is found in nearly every organization, and that is the human psychology. All right, because we're human, there are things that we will do. All right, so social engineering um, attacks or methods will differ. Some of them will be using cell phones. Some of them will be using media. Some some will will. will will send you a text, but they come in different types of forms. And we're gonna go through these social engineering um, threats. The first type that we're gonna, we're gonna look at is phishing. Now, phishing is an attempt to obtain um, sensitive information, um, such as usernames, passwords, and credit card details by disguising um, themselves by being, uh, um, disguise themselves as being a person that's trustworthy. So usually um, a person would send an email and trick you into believing that they are probably who, you know, somebody that you know very well and try to trick you into giving away your information, um, especially sensitive information. Spear phishing is also another form of phishing. But as the, 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 the term would, um, would, would indicate, it is a specific target that they're gonna go look at, they're going to um, select. So whereas phishing might be general, and so a phishing, a fish, a phishing attempt might be um, targeted to a whole organization, spear phishing is very selective. They're looking for a specific person to target. And usually that person is, um, holds a key position um, and their intent is to steal information or data from that, that person from, for malicious purposes. Um, uh, there's also another um, term that is also used side by side with spear phishing is whale phishing. And basically it's the same thing, but the, because of this, the, the term whale, you would get the idea that they mean they want a bigger target. So spear phishing might looking at a little fish, a whale might be a, a, a CEO or PS or something like that. And there's, there's, the intent is the same, is to um, see if they can get um, you to trust them enough to give them um, your sensitive information. Pretexting. Um, Pretexting is another form of, um, of, of social engineering. And what it what a person does in this instance is just to pretend um, that there's somebody else. So for instance, um, somebody may have just lost their laptop. Um, a person comes by it, decides, well, listen, I'm gonna see if I can get in. Um, I realize there are some applications and I'm gonna pretend that I am this person so that I can get the password because I can't get onto the, the laptop because there's a username and password and they will call. And they will say, well, my name is, um, John Brown. Um, I work in the uh, Ministry of, of, of Energy. I've just locked myself on. I can't remember the password. Could you reset it for me? And because that person sounds so genuine and we have the human feeling of trusting people, um, that person may be um, it's successful in getting um, a password. Baiting is another form of um, social engineering. Um, and it, what it does though is that it offers you something in return for something. So you probably might see an email that says, all right, um, um, don't you want to have access to free music or free view videos for the rest of your life or free membership to getting access to music or videos for the rest of the year? Um, and then it's a, if, you, if you're willing or you're, you know, you're really interested in, in this offer, um, are you willing to consider it? 
please put in the information into this box. And it, will may, look, it may look legit. So some would be telling you, all right, can I get your first name, your last name? Could I get your credit card number? And so on and so on and so forth. And because of the medium that you're using, it looks legit. And there you go, you're, you're attracted to doing something that you know that you shouldn't do just because they baited you with like a, a dangling carrot or something. So that's baiting. Fishing, vishing, sorry. Vishing is also another co uh, common cyber threat. But in this, in this instance, it's actually um, voice phishing. Um, what you, what in, in, in this instance, uh, their method is to use um, the, the cell phone or any phone and to try to get information from you. You know, and sometimes they'll use recorded messages um, telling you that, you know, uh, you're, a you're, 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 you're a recipient for um, some credit for your credit card. Um, they had a, they had a, um, um, probably a, a random draw and you were chosen. And so therefore you're lucky um, and you're going to be given $500 in, in uh, extra cash for spending and all you have to do is um, to prove your, your identity and to validate that you are the person that you are. Um, please give me your telephone number, your address, your email, your um, credit card details, and also the, the nice security pin number that you have at the back of it. Um, so it's a cyber, it's a, it's, a, it's a form of phishing, but done via the, the, um, the phone. Other common, farm, um, other common cyber attacks include things like farming. And farming is just um, an online scam where um, somebody installs software or malicious code on your hard drive. And when you do that, um, without you knowing, um, what happens is that when, when you go to the internet and every time you try to select a site, uh, click on a link to go to somewhere else, it will redirect you to a different site. So that you know that you, would, you swore that you type in www.nationnews.com and you hit enter and for some reason it carrying you to a site that's trying to sell you um, um, questionable software. And uh, spoofing is another um, cyber cyber threat and spoof, spoofing is really um, email um, that is forged uh, with, a, with a, using um, a credible header and so, and it will send a message out to you. Um, and it seems to, that it, it, it actually originates from where they say it was reading from. But if you look closely, there's always something that gives it away. So you may see that something comes up from amazon.com that says, uh, we've just recognized that there's some malicious activity that's going on with your account. Um, can you please um, type in your username and password here so that we can verify that you are the person that you are or you know, um, and in that way, they get information from you. Another, and, and, and another, but uh, one of the most common cyber threats um, around is the theft of passwords. Um, and passwords are always considered as the golden key to a network. And hackers, will do everything possible to get, a, um, uh, to get your password. Um, attacker may use things like um, the dictionary um, cracker or the brute force method of cracking um, your password. And, the, and these are just little this software that will load on and it will go cycle through a random um, selection of passwords until they are lucky to hit the right one. Uh, for the, dic the dictionary, sorry, um, cracker, what it will do is that it will first try to find or identify uh, words that you're, you're commonly find in a dic dictionary. And the same thing with brute force, uh, what it will do is just use a combination of characters, letters, numbers, and special, um, special characters to see if it can crack your password. Um, also, it's, it's um, um, important to note that hackers may also use programs such as um, key loggers um, so that they can record your keystrokes on your keyboard um, in order to steal your password as well. And one of the biggest cyber threat, um, and that's only my 
humble opinion, is the use of open, free, public Wi-Fi. Um, again, uh, doing their homework, uh, a social engineering um, hacker will always determine that there's nothing more attractive than free access to Wi-Fi. And they will just set up a public uh, Wi-Fi hub to specifically trick you into giving away your details. And wherever possible, I, I always advise people not to. Um, please don't fall to the, the um, attraction of getting free Wi-Fi and, and logging on to open Wi-Fi, unless that you're gonna use it only for the purpose of surfing. And if it's only gonna do use it for the purpose of surfing, you wanna look at the, um, the local news or something like that, fine. But uh, wherever possible, avoid public open Wi-Fi's. Another common cyber threat is the use of uh, USB drives to steal information from, um, and other storage devices to, to steal information from your computer. Um, and this is a tactic that is, 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 is widely used, um, especially at trade shows or conferences, and I'm sure quite a number of you would have attended some in the past and may attend some in the future. Uh, the first thing that people try to do is always tell you, hey, give you a free USB. And nine, nine, ten or ten people take it and, and use it without thinking, what could be on that, that, that USB stick? What could be on that free storage device? So that's another common cyber threat. And the most important human error is the most common cyber threat to any network. Because we are human, we are prone to make mistakes. And in order to overcome that, what we have to do is always continue to try to practice good cyber hygiene. And when I say human error, I'm, I'm referring to things like, um, you know, writing your password on a, on a sticky note and stick it in on your laptop. I know there are a lot of people who are guilty of, of doing that. Um, also, probably leave, going to the bathroom and leaving your computer unlocked. Um, in a safe environment, that's okay. But if you continue to practice that, it means that when you're not in a safe environment, suppose you're overseas on course, you're at the airport, you're somewhere, and you were on the computer, and you just walk away from it, there is an opportunity that would be exploited by anybody who, a hacker that's sitting by, to go to that computer and steal um, personal information. So the human error is one of the biggest cyber threats. Um, that we face. Based on what we've discussed so far, um, and I'm sure that you have also had personal experiences, um, especially surfing the net, I, I, want to, I want to also measure from your response, what are the measures that you take to, um, to stay safe online uh, before we actually start identifying what we should do um, to stay safe online. Um, like you've done before, could you please um, enter your, your, your comments into the chat? Well, I see some very interesting comments and questions. Yeah, okay, we have some responses here as well. Um, some person say two-step verification. That's great. Yes, uh, awesome. Yeah. And they look yes. for secure HTTPS when they're doing yes. online transactions. Awesome, Good. yes, yes. Yeah. Delete suspect emails. Mm -hmm. um, the use of VPNs where possible is another one. Awesome, that's very good, yes. And the person indicated that they change their password on a regular basis and they don't give it out. That's good. That's very, very good. good. We're getting some very good tips. Yes, we are. Ensure virus protection software is installed. Awesome. And, That's good. Yep. Yes. And some individuals, they close um, the banking apps after every use. Very good. Don't leave it running in the background. Excellent. No? That's good. Yes. Okay. All right, based off of the response, I'm, 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 I'm not so worried anymore 
um, it just it just goes to show that the uh, public sector is full of people who are quite aware of what are the good cyber hygiene practices and they're actually practicing them. Okay, and so that we so that we can continue on with webinar, we're going to break here, and we're going to go on and discuss how to maintain a secure system. Now, after all this is, and then I, I, I just want to draw attention to a comment that was made um, by one of the participants where, that after hearing all this information, um, you start to get paranoid, you, you start to get scared, and rightly so. Um, nine times out of 10, we, we are not aware of the threats, but if we practice good, high, um, practice good cyber hygiene and if we ensure that we carry out specific um, best practices, uh, what we do is that we will mitigate those risks. That means that we would, will narrow them, them down. And so we're gonna start looking at some of these good, um, best, good practices um, and best practices in terms of you personally as the individual um, or the employee within public sector and then we'll look at some other recommendations that I would make in relation to persons who occupy or are part of the administrative, technical, or strategic um, um, group within government. All right, so how do we maintain a, a secure system? We're, we're going down to at the individual level. At the individ individual level, we have to make sure that we install antivirus software. That is a must. There is no system should attempt to be placed on a network to access the internet especially and it does not have um, the most current up-to-date software so make sure that you install soft, um, antivirus software that is a must and antivirus software will do very well at detecting and preventing um, malicious um, activity or damage being done to your computer Also, um, you're gonna have to keep your operating system up, 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 up to date. Um, this may seem daunting, but it's not. Um, nine times out of 10, when you get a system, your operating system is set to automatically detect whether it needs to be updated. Uh, they need to go online and, and draw down the, the, the latest patches so you can keep it up to date and to look out any vulnerabilities that could be um, used by hackers. To, to damage or uh, conduct malicious activity on your computer. So installing antivirus software and keeping your operating system up to date is one of the best practices that you could um, in, in, in that. Maintaining a secure system, of course, we're going to advocate the use of personal firewalls. And when we say use of personal firewalls, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that majority of us who are attending the webinar are people who have computers that use um, the commonly used operating systems like Windows. Um, usually when, and when I'm not, I can't really speak too much to, to the other um, types like Google and those other platforms, but for sure, uh, like Microsoft Windows, offers uh, users to enact or activate personal firewalls on their systems. And nine times out of 10, it is done by default. So this personal firewall would make sure that it's going to detect any, any malicious activity and stop it. So if somebody's probing your, your, your ports or scanning your ports, it would automatically in the background de deter those uh, um, attempts. And encrypting your hard drive. This is something that I would advocate very strongly. Nine times out of 10, people don't do it. Um, or, or some of them would be intimidated by it, but it's not. Um, the encryption software, especially in, uh, that's being developed today, are very user-friendly. And the intent is to in encrypt everything that you have, especially in your hard drive and your phone. You never know when things will go missing. And if something goes missing, especially if you're a person who is privy or has free access to very sensitive information, especially at birth, you want to make sure that when you, when you have your corporate laptop or your, your corporate cell phone, your personal laptops or your personal devices, that information that's stored on it is not readily accessible 
if somebody acquires possession of it, all right? So encrypt, encrypt your, 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 your thumb drives, encrypt your, um, your jump sticks, encrypt everything, um, your, your, your mobile um, storage devices. And a password manager. Somebody was asking, how can you select, um, I think I, I, I saw that um, remark somewhere in the chat, but somebody was asking, how can I protect my password? And this is the best thing to use. A password manager um, usually um, performs two rules, important rules. One, it will create a very strong password for you. Um, too often, we, we do it the shortcut way. Um, one password for everything. And if I was to do a poll, I am sure if we tell the truth, 99% of us use one password for nearly everything. So I use the same password for Twitter. I'll use the same password for my, uh, my login. I'll use the same password for my emails. I'll probably even use the same password for your, your, your access to your, your, your mobile banking applications. So to avoid doing that, I will encourage you to get a password manager. A password manager, when you go to it, you will, ask, you, you, you will say, listen, I need you to generate a password. And it will generate this password. And once you generate the password and then you, you, you link it to a specific site, it will store it in an encrypted database on your computer. And once that happens, um, then nobody can get to it. There are other sites that do it for you automatically, like Google Chrome will do that. Um, but they don't, they're not very good at giving you um, strong passwords. In other words, they may not recommend that you, you, you use a strong password. All they will just ask you, do you want me to store it? All right. So password managers are, 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 the, are the way to go in regards to securing your systems. And of course, my pet peeve, and I'm sure a lot of people um, may share the same um, sentiment after this webinar. In order to maintain a secure system, please avoid questionable networks. Um, too often, like I said before, um, if you see a network that's offering open Wi-Fi and it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't state that it's using, you know, um, um, specific types of of, of logging uh, credentials, then we have problems. And on unless um, you're going to use this web, this sorry, this this open or questionable network simply for um, surfing to, to get like uh, the news and stuff like that, I'm still will be wary of encouraging you to put yourself at risk. Um, always use a wi a wi a Wi-Fi network that says that you are you that you have to put in a WPA or a WPA2 authentication type uh, form of, of authentication. Uh, open Wi-Fi's are hotbeds for hackers waiting to carry out nefarious activities. Maintaining secure smartphones is another very um, often overlooked topic. Um, a lot of us just use cell phones and we just walk away on the go and we don't realize that um, there's a, it's a lot of value in, those, in those, those devices when they go missing. I'm sure if you sit down, you think um, things that you do on that cell phone, you have, you have WhatsApp, you have contacts, you have banking applications, you may have applications that you, you pay um, your utilities on. You may also have um, access to, to, to insurance portals and stuff like that. And so it is because of that, you have to make sure that you take the effort to maintain a very secure smartphone. And in doing that, you make sure that you always keep it locked. Um, some of us think that oh, this is too much every minute I have to punch in a code. Please do that. I, there are a number of ways that you can enact security. Um, you can do it through, you can go it through a gesture or you can put it, um, enact it with your, your um, fingerprint. Um, whatever te technology that is available, use it to secure your phone. So keep your phone locked. Also, um, use a secure, um, use, use um, secure passwords and make sure that your devices are up to date, especially where um, there are downloads. Um, you know, alerting you that there's an update, make sure you, you, you take note of that, that uh, message and update your phone. 
staying safe on social media. Um, some of us would be asking, well, I'm in the public service and, you know, why, why would we talk about social media? Uh, but if we look around, uh, we are finding that more and more ministries are using this as are using media sites, uh, platforms, sorry, um, as a way to reach their customers. Um, and because of that, we have to be very wary of what we do on social media. Now, if we're, if, we're, if we're on the site, I want you to make sure that there are things that you do to ensure that those um, platforms are safe for you. So like I've indicated before, you make sure that you create unique passwords for every social media platform. So if you, use, if you have one password that you're using from Facebook, please don't use the same one for, for Twitter or Instagram. Try to see if you can make um, each platform unique in terms of its pa um, the password that you select um, as your login as your login credential, um, be selective, of course, of the people that you befriend. There are a lot of people who say they want to be your friends, and they have nefarious reasons as to why they want to be your friend. Some will look, be doing that to see if they can steal your your identity, and so on and so forth. So be careful um, who you accept as friends. Be very selective. Also, sometimes there are some links that appear. You know, all of a sudden somebody posts something and, and there's a link that says, right, uh, try out this, uh, uh, um, this new type of perfume and we're going on, on, on a um, out of this world sale where you can get this perfume at 75% off and, or a famous brand shoe like a Nike that's being you know, sold for 95% or something like that. If it's too good uh, to be true, that is exactly what it is. It's too good to be true. And they will offer you links to click on and nine times out of 10, these, these links don't add up to what they said they were in the first place. So avoid clicking on these links. And please do not post any sensitive information. And when we say sensitive information, sensitive information in terms of uh, things that are going on. Or if you know that you're, you're about to embark on, on, on a closing of a, or, or um, the start of a new project, but it has not yet received permission from authorities, don't post it. Um, don't post don't post things like uh, your desk phone or your cell phone number that you that you can be reached at if you need to be uh, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a client wants to to get in contact with somebody urgently and, and please don't tell people that you're you're on vacation too often we, we, we like to brag oh, on, on the flight going out and people who are sitting down might be 10% saying good for you and another 90% saying oh yeah she's not at work so what I can do is I go pass by her her um her desk I know her password and I'll I'll do some um, transactions on her behalf so do not post anything sensitive on uh, your social media accounts that goes without saying and we want you to also um, secure how you use your email accounts um, wherever possible, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, government is embarking on this project as well, wherever possible, do a double um, factoring authentication for added security. And I know that this term came up early, but just in case, uh, for those who um, may not understand when we say double factor uh, authentication, it means that you, you have to prove who you say you are in more than one ways. Um, before it was only punching your password, give me your username and password and we're good to go. Um, those who have uh, email accounts, especially those like uh, um, Yahoo and Gmail, um, they're, they're now starting to ask you to do certain things like, okay, you say you want me to change this password. All right, um, another, what I want you to do is look on your phone and tell me what's the code that I sent uh, to your phone that's registered as um, your, your first means or primary means of contact. And so, so you have a number of ways that you have to prove who you say you are. So wherever possible, um, see if you can, if you can um, activate a, a system like that for your email accounts. Secondly, um, if you're using your, your corporate email, please do not use your corporate email to conduct personal business. Um, try to keep both separate. And the reason why is sometimes you might inadvertently send your uh, uh, email to somebody um, that you think that you trust. And they will use that email to do other nefarious things, probably like copy it, um, forge it, especially if it has a, a, a legit, legitimate header. So whatever you do, try to separate corporate, personal um, at all times. 
And definitely avoid trying to open your corporate email on unsecure networks. Um, that is one of the biggest concerns that they have where um, you might be at the airport and you decide, well, I'm gonna log in here so and, and push off some emails and respond to the PS about X, Y, and Z. And you're gonna use, and you, you tend, you want to use the open Wi-Fi, which I will not um, um, advocate. Don't do that. Uh, wherever possible, use a secure network. Some people are gonna ask, oh, well, I'm in the airport and I'm there for a while. What other means can I do? Um, uh, can I use, sorry, to, to, to be able to get um, data access? I would encourage people to use your phone as a hotspot. And when I say um, a hotspot, meaning um, you take your phone, you set it to say, well, listen, uh, for now, you're gonna act as my, um, my, my rover, and what I want is a gateway out to the internet, and I'm gonna use the phone as my secure method of doing that. I will run up some data charges, but it's a much safer way of doing that. And especially in, in, um, in the corporate environment, be careful of the type of emails that are soliciting information. Um, if something looks strange or you receive an email from somebody that you've, you've never been in contact with and they're asking you um, to divulge um, sensitive information, um, avoid it, uh, report it, but wherever possible, do not respond to any emails that look suspicious or um, is unsolicited unsolic in any way. And definitely avoid sending confidential and sensitive corporate information via the email. If you have something like um, uh, a confidential agreement, uh, 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 um, a contract, unless you are going to encrypt that, that document, avoid sending it um, across uh, the email. Staying safe. All right, what we would have covered so far were, 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 were tips and recommendations for you, the participant, um, personally, when you're conducting business on the government's behalf or, when you, or if you're doing business for, as, as, a, as you know, a, a personal chore. Um, but what I'm going to recommend now is really more or less targeting uh, persons who are attending this webinar and they are either in the technical or administrative or executive leader roles. And because of that, it means that it is a broader strategic um, recommendation that I'm going to be making. And so the first thing I'm going to state is that with regards to keeping your network safe and keeping your employees safe or keeping your team safe um, or the ministry safe. Uh, what I would recommend first is that um, cyber awareness and cyber hygiene training is conducted regularly for your personnel. And because you've done it once last year, doesn't mean that they don't need to hear it as often as they possibly can. So wherever possible, see if you can um, agitate or encourage uh, whoever is responsible for conducting training, that training on cybersecurity or cyber hygiene is done regularly for your, your, um, your employees or members of the public service. Another step in the right step towards securing and our networks and, and, and staying safe is the reviewing and implementing administrative and user policies or guidelines or best practices. And when I say administrative policies, I mean administrative policies in terms of um, a policy that dictates how passwords are managed, um, how, what type of virus protection should be used, what type of encryption should be used, what type of authentication should be used, and, uh, and, and more importantly, what type of disaster recovery plans are in place if there is a disaster or an or an incident. Um, for in terms of user policies, uh, I would recommend that if they're not already um, created or and are there are they already created, they should be reviewed or updated in terms of um, appropriate usage policies for your, your employees. And when I said appropriate use, it means appropriate use of your network. How how are you supposed to use your network at work? How are you supposed to use the internet? How are you supposed to use the, the corporate email? 
I, what, what, what about, what are the, the policies in terms of me, um, the employee with, ver with regards to going on social media? What am I not allowed to do? Am I allowed to take a picture of myself um, at work or, or, or am I allowed to make um, political statements or am I allowed to make statements that are um, defamatory using a public platform? Um, especially if you're going to use the, the, the corporate social media platform. So those type of policies should be in place. I will also in, encourage um, that an audit is, is done. And when I say an audit, I mean a vulnerability audit. Um, there, there are quite a number of, of skills um, and experience um, um, technicians are available who can carry out this audit for you. And, and this audit is really more or less to determine what your, what your vulnerabilities are. That means where are you now, where you should be, and where, where you, you, know, you could be. And that's in terms, in, in, in relation to best practices, standards uh, at the at international level. And usually you're, gonna, you're going to conduct these vulnerability assessments in the hope of being able to implement and meet um, international standards in terms of um, um, managing information systems. And there are a number of these standards that I want to mention. Um, the, 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 the NIST 853 and the IC, ISO standard of um, 2701, 2700, sorry, M1, uh, those are very solid international standards that we should really aim to achieve in terms of managing our networks and making sure that they meet the international standards for management and architect. I would also like and greatly encourage that uh, when you're implementing a security or cybersecurity strategy or program that you include physical security. And too often, we don't remember that cybersecurity is not only about what happens on the on cyberspace, but also we want to look closely at how you can prevent cyber cybersecurity um, uh, breaches. Sorry, to cybersecurity because of the fact that we paid attention to our physical environment. So if we work in an office and nobody's challenging you when you come in and nobody's challenging you when you sit down on the pers as a person's desk, there that means that we are vulnerable um, to, to attacks. And that means somebody can come in and steal property. Somebody can cause malicious damage by pushing a USB stick into a computer if they don't have the authority to do so. So when you're implementing cybersecurity strategies, always make sure that a physical, uh, physical security strategy is also in place. And then you're gonna use things, strategies um, and products that would prevent people from getting physical access to sensitive areas. And when I say sensitive areas, in terms of the building, so you have a, a fence. Um, in terms of the front door, you have like a biometric um, access. Um, um, key code um, control device or system. And um, you, you want to make sure that there might be a security pad that you have to put in the correct security, security code if a person has to get into the, into the server room. So always consider physical security as part of your cybersecurity strategy. And for technicians, especially those who manage uh, the networks, we want to ensure that you employ defense in depth. And when you say defense in depth, it means that you have more than one device or mechanism to prevent people from getting unauthorized access into your network. And for the techies in the room, that means we're talking about firewalls and intrusion detection devices. Uh, we're talking about network segmentation in terms of how you design your network. And we're talking about gateway security devices, especially for email and probably for internet. Um, also uh, for the techies in the room and also for the participants, especially those who are, who are working from home, we have to ensure that we're using credible um, and, and, and strong VPNs uh, when we're accessing the network. We have to make sure that our devices are, are patched, uh, patched right up and we're using the latest version of the antivirus, especially when we are going to initiate a remote, uh, um, an, a connection from a remote location. So if I'm at home, it means that I'm punching through the internet 
and I'm getting into the to, into my my uh, information systems at work, and you want to make sure that there is no way that any hacker who's waiting can take advantage of any vulnerability if it exists. And um, at all levels, uh, that's in, in, in um, for both administrative, for the technical staff, for even the, the at personal level, always employ the principle of the least privilege strategy. So when I said the privilege, um, the, pri the principle, sorry, of least privilege, it means that any person who comes into your environment, any person who comes into your department or, or is assigned to your, to, to, even if it's a temporary uh, assignment, anybody who's employed within um, your, your, your department should only be given the access and it has to be bare minimum access that is required for them to perform their job. So if I, Captain Gail Morgan, came to your departments and I'm going to only sit here for two weeks, there's no need for me to have access to your to all of your folders, especially if it's the human resource folder or the medical folder and so on and so forth. All right, and I've said quite enough, and I think that is where I'm going to wrap up. I think at this point, Michael is going to assist in the conduct of a participant poll. Michael? Uh, yes, Captain Morgan, thank you very much. Um, I would like to participants to complete the poll that has appeared on their screen. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to do that. And the result of these polls will, use, will be used to do conduct an analysis of the type of security practices that are employed by you, the participants. So we leave it up for 30 seconds, 45 in max. And Captain Morgan, while we wait for these results, um, I'll sure. just pose a question to you quickly. Sure. Um, it is how safe are charging ports located at airports and train stations? Well, uh, this is in terms of charging, um, charging up a device. Um, yes, yeah, charging a device through USB I've, port. I've not, I've, I've not been yet made aware of any threats um, or or risks associated with charging your phones. So I, I don't see it really as, as, as something that you're going to really worry too much about. Um, feel free to charge it before. Okay. We're going to end the poll in 10 seconds. Um, further question for you, Captain Morgan, as we wait for this 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. How does the use of virtual meeting platforms like Zoom and GoToMeeting feed into cybersecurity? Very good question. And I think there's a, there's a lot of noise, not really a lot of noise, I'm sorry, a lot of discussion that's going on um, with regards to how safe the platforms are in terms of having virtual uh, meetings. And uh, basically, uh, with regards to cybersecurity, there have been a number of incidences where people were able to hack into to these platforms. Um, some people nefariously got themselves in and, and conducted unsavory types of activities. Um, however, I can, assure, I can assure you that the, the well-known brands, the, the ones like Zoom, um, uh, uh, Web Access, and those other people have taken quite um, a, not, a lot of energy into ensuring that they're, they're, they're minimizing all the vulnerabilities uh, that could be exploited by, by hackers. Um, especially during the pandemic, I don't think it was, it was really much of a matter for concern, but because that there was a a drastic increase in the, in the amount of, of meetings that were being held um, recently. Uh, these platforms have been uh, been questioned um, quite vigorously by by the um, the international com um, communities in terms of their their uh, their reliability and, and safety. Uh, okay. So, yeah, there 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 have been some um, unfortunate uh, incidences where um, there their suitability for, for hosting um, or hold, hosting um, confidential high top secret type of meetings, I, I would not encourage those to be used. Okay, thank if you it, very much. Now, if wait. you can just have a look at the poll results. 
and give us one or two comments on what you see. Awesome. Right, with regard to the um, question, which of the discussed preventative methods do you currently utilize? All right, um, we have seen some high polling in some numbers, um, especially like 72% of you have indicated that you actually use unique and different passwords um, for different applications. Very well done. Um, what, what, I, uh, what, I, what I will hone in on are some of the ones that I've received some of the percentages. Um, so um, the one with avoid using shortened URLs. All right, um, I just wanna make sure that everybody understood what that, that question meant. So basically if you receive an email and basically you don't know who sent you this email, but it's telling you to click on this link. Now, usually if it's a legitimate link, it will, it will be a very long um, address for the internet, like amazon.com, something slash, maybe uh, shoes, uh, women, so on and so forth. But if you see something that comes up with a, with, with a very abbreviated type of address, I'm not saying that they're all um, uh, fraudulent, but they all should be treated with a grain of suspicion. So you should avoid clicking on those things. And I think I probably did not um, stress on that enough during my presentation. But wherever possible, if you receive an email or a message that in, that's inviting you to click on this link to be, uh, to be um, sent to a different website, if it's abbreviated and it only has like a BIT slash UZL, um, walk away from it. Okay, thank you, Captain Morgan. Okay, but otherwise, very good. I'm really, I'm really, I'm really heartened by the number of positive um, responses that we received here. Uh, Michael, I think there are quite a number of, of questions that are being posed. But we'll try to. Yes, see there are it. quite a few questions, um, yeah. but since we are um, a bit pressed for time. Time, yes. Yes, yes. time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're Where to go to if there's a threat? All right. Um, some of you may, may ask if something happens, if something um, happens and, and I'm, not a, I'm not too sure if I should report it or, or I've, something did happen, I'm quite aware of what happened and I need help with it. These are the people that you can reach out to. Um, the Data Processing Department here at the Ministry of Innovation, Science and, and Smart Technologies. Um, you can also get in contact with the Cyber Crime Unit at the Royal Barbados Police Force. And you can also um, make a report at the Crime Stoppers um, Barbados um, and submit your anonymous tip in terms of, well, listen, I just, something just happened to me at this ATM or something like that. And uh, they would be more than happy with this. Questions? Well, could you actually wrap up for me though, Captain Morgan? <laughs> yes. And, um, <laughs> I'm really sorry that I am not able to answer all these questions um, because of the fact, like we said, we had constraint, con limitation and constraints in time. I uh, really apologize for that. Uh, what we will do is take note and probably hope to see if we can have a form like this in the very near future so that we can address all of your concerns. Um, based off of the questions, um, see if we can design a, a webinar that specifically is catering to answering your questions. I really want to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you. Um, um, it, it, it was a pleasure hosting this, this webinar. I'm hoping that I may have this opportunity again. And I really do appreciate the fact that you guys were very, very, very well um, um, knowledgeable and, and, and in sure. terms of what's going on with cybersecurity, but also you were very interactive as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Okay. Thank you, Captain Morgan, um, for providing this very timely and important information that concerns everyone, not just with regards to their work environment and professional life, but also their home and private life. Um, I, as you had indicated before, there were several questions that we received, and unfortunately, due to time constraints, we are unable to answer those questions. However, I still ask you to continue to post your questions in the chat. We will still be monitoring the chat for a couple of minutes after the session has ended. And we compile all those answers, we record them, and we'll produce a question and answer document, which will be made available for you, the participants, to access and download. Also, additionally, we will provide access to the PowerPoint presentation 
Um, it will also be shared on our YouTube channel where you can go and watch the a video of the presentation and recap exactly what was said today. So colleagues at this time, I would like to thank you for being a part of our webinar on behalf of Captain Morgan, as well as the team here at Learning Development Directorate. Thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Clark and do have a great day. Goodbye. Thank you.